And we are live. It is Thursday, April 30th, 2020, 5 o'clock p.m. Boris Johnson pledges to reveal the roadmap out of lockdown. He says the UK is past the peak. Uh, this is one day after he's announced the birth of his son. Um, Kim Jong-un, meanwhile, is sick says Taiwan's intelligence service. And the US says, get this, we haven't seen him recently. Uh, <laughs> we're not allowed to have fun anymore. And Kate and I are particularly not allowed to have fun anymore because we are being bombarded <laughs> oh with Twitter trolls. Uh, unbelievable volume. Uh, but there is one bright side of this, which is that Tomas Ilvis our guest yesterday, former president of Estonia, just tweeted at one of the trolls. Um, oh, I can't find the tweet now. I'll uh, find it. Uh, he said. He said, I, I wish you'd shut up already and brush your remaining teeth and then clean your bathroom or clean your room in mom's basement. <laughs> uh, so that, that is how a real president uh, throws shade. Um, anyway, we're not allowed to have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we have the next best thing, which is David Plotz in the gloaming there in his dark room, his beard blending in with the background. You can barely see him, but he's there. Former editor of Slate, former chief muckety muck at Atlas Obscura until the other day guru of the Slate political gab fest. And uh, I was thinking like, like somebody I've known so long in Washington that I don't even remember how we know each other. Uh, David Plotz. I can tell you how. I'll tell you how. Is you it want. through Jessica Roth? Through Jessica Roth. Yeah. There you go. Really? Yeah. Well, uh, they went to college together and she was a friend of my wife's and she introduced us. Wait, oh, the like the like the the Cardozo law professor we just yes oh yes cool it's I didn't even I mean I know she's a law professor I didn't know where she was a law professor I don't even know <laughs> where she professes I saw her at my college reunion she's great uh she's great welcome to in lieu of fun David thank you it's so nice to be here uh sorry I if you saw me I'm picking I went out for a walk uh which is fun and my raincoat is shedding. So I was just picking pieces of my raincoat off of my body. That's that, that's what- That is see. what the audience needed to know. Um, I needed to know that. <laughs> can I tell my favorite early Ben Witta story, Ben? Can I, is Amitai Etzioni alive? Yeah, he's alive. Um, I don't, <laughs> like, uh, no, alive I and- tell. I don't think you should tell that story. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, <laughs> Man, really? <laughs> I'm, what? I'm not, I'm not even Sorry. sure what story that is. But you I'm, really are in lieu of fun, I, All I can say <laughs> is the word. Like... I'll just say, I'm just going to say jury duty. Oh, man, don't tell that story. <laughs> okay. Tell a, oh. tell a different early That's the only one I remember. Story. It's a, it's a, it's a great story for your memoir one day. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, yeah, things that will turn my face red. The story is true. Um, anyway. Um, what do we want to talk about? What are you drinking, but, David? Oh my God, I forgot to get a drink. I don't. David, have a drink. you're allowed to get up and go get a drink. We'll um, we'll cover for you. I don't. Is it is it uh, does it have to be alcoholic? I mean, I it's not that I have a I have any principle against drinking alcohol. It's just I tend not to drink this early in the day, unlike certain people. But if you want me to get an alcoholic drink, I will get. Uh, I have no preference. Um, yes, uh, it's, uh, uh, totally I, up to you. I am having seltzer, you... but I'm probably going to go get a beer in a second. I'm going to go. I'm just going to go get a seltzer. Why don't you guys talk about me? You can um, you can say things about me yeah. while I'm gone. You talk about they, everything that's been going on with Lisa. I don't know who Lisa is, but you guys talk about that. <laughs> yes, the, you do. The, <laughs> so so okay. Um, go get go get a beer or go get a drink or whatever. Um. Hey, uh, give people a rundown of the last 24 hours because it has been actually pretty, pretty intense. So I think that like I tweeted a week ago, like when Lisa came into our show as a surprise and I was so excited 
I tweeted about it and how what a nice surprise it was. And she retweeted it with a comment. Uh, and that was like the last thing in her feed. And it was like from 10 days ago. But when like, I don't need honestly, honest to God, Ben, I don't even know what the news is that has made everything turn like crazy on this. More documents on Flynn. I don't know, something, something. It's more documents on Flynn. Is okay. The That's like basically what I took away from it. But basically all of a sudden I woke up and there was just like my notifications were just full of people calling her slash me slash everyone responding to that last tweet, like a whore, hoping that we died, hoping that we were raped, like tramps, traitors, like hope you hang, like all of this kind of stuff. And it was just like this front row seat. It, like I knew it kind of wasn't directed at me because it was like, this is not directed at me. Like, what is this about? And it was like, it was you, me and her and we were all tagged in it. And so it just like all came at us. And I just like, it was just, it was just, it's just, it's just taken over my entire feed. And I was just DMing with Thomas about like Ilves who about like, dealing with it. And he was like, I've spent like the last 24 hours blocking people. And I was like, I just gave up. I just like, I didn't even care. Like, I was like, okay, I guess I'm not going to get any of my important notifications, important notifications. Um, yeah, it just Wait. has been over. And then I tried to stage a coup of like, and we it got some good coverage. No, but you got, you, you, you generated some nice, uh, 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 very a lot of people sending nice images of things as a result of that tweet of yours. No, it's been like one of the more intense periods. Uh, uh, yes, David. I, sorry, I was wait. Can you just give me the five second version of why you guys are uh, under attack? Oh, and under can I and please can I not be whoever is attacking you? Please don't be listening and attacking me. I have nothing to do with it. I don't. No, want to be you're it's not. Uh, no, the reason is twofold. Uh, one is that we are on a, thre a thread on Twitter with Lisa Page, uh, who showed up on In Lieu of Fun a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, and tweeted about it. And so lots of people who are throwing bile at Lisa are uh, uh, catching us inadvertently. But in addition, for the same reason that people are throwing bile at Lisa today, they're also throwing bile at me. And therefore everything that I tweet that involves Kate. So Kate's getting collateral uh, fire for two distinct reasons. Uh, I would say probably 70% of it is directed at Lisa, 30% of it's directed at me. And a lot of it is- uh, No one cares about me. <laughs> yeah, no one's throwing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but a lot of it is there's a fair bit of like, uh, you know, you're going to be raped at Guantanamo by, you know, Jim Comey kind of stuff. Um, isn't Jim Comey your friend? Why would he rape you? <laughs> well, <laughs> Lockheed is not really the, well, the, you've really you've really sussed out that the, would be a quaint like, that would be <laughs> you've really sussed out something. the uh, the the terrible the like the terrible lo lo logistical flaws in these arguments right like you've you've burrowed to the, <laughs> to, the, to the the rotten core of the argument here David all right um, we are going to uh, uh, burrow deep into the Plotzian core. Uh, dude, you ran Slate, you ran Atlas Obscura. Now you're back in Washington. What next? Have you always been in Washington? I've always been in Washington, but Atlas Obscura, which is this great company, which I ran um, for the last six years, uh, is in Brooklyn. So I had a commuting life where I would go to Brooklyn every week on Monday morning and come home on Wednesday night, which is, mm -hmm. I do not recommend, strongly, strongly dis, disrecommend. Uh, where was it? Where was it in Brooklyn? It's in Greenpoint. Oh, okay, cool. Are you, are you in Brooklyn? I was. Um, yeah, I lived in Park Slope, Bish by Barclay Center. Oh, yeah. But Kate has decamped to, to don't say Hudson. Don't say Hudson. undisclosed location. Cape Cod. Oh, okay. Uh, that was Hudson before there was Hudson. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I, so I've ha I'm actually in one more thing I'm doing for all your viewers and listeners, which is that I'm now working with Henry Blodgett over at Business Insider, and he and I are writing a daily newsletter, because God knows people do not get, there are not enough daily newsletters. Everyone needs another daily newsletter. So Henry and I are writing a daily newsletter, which you can get if you go to read.bi slash plots. 
Um, and uh, it's good to, I haven't been writing for years, so it's nice to be writing again. Yeah, so let's talk about that. You... Yeah, I'd love to know the story of like how you got into journalism, how you find your way to Slate, everything else. I don't want to like take over Ben's questions, but. No, no, no. So uh, sure. I know the answer to that question, like, like down to the level of what the senior thesis was about, but it's a great story. So why don't you tell it? How did you get into this racket? So I got into journalism um, via the city paper. I'd been a college journalist and but not a very good one <laughs> or a particularly accomplished one. I had, there were really accomplished journalists in my world. So Mike Grunwald was in my class of Politico, Susan Glasser of The New Yorker uh, was uh, somebody I worked with in college. And uh, I, I thought I was gonna be a lawyer. So I came to DC and was a paralegal at DOJ with the intent of going to law school, hated it. Like with for a minute, within minutes of getting in, to DOJ, I, I thought like, I need to get the hell out of here. You know who my boss was, my Uber boss was? Bill Barr. I started, he was the, he was the acting attorney general during the last days of the, the Bush administration, right? Wasn't he? No, he was but, the yeah. actual attorney general. Or maybe he's the act, actual yeah. attorney general. Um, and, and so I very quickly started to realize that, you know, I should try journalism. I wrote to 92 newspapers. This was 1991. I wrote, cause I thought, oh, you go work at a small newspaper. I wrote to 92 newspapers. 91 of them did not reply. I did hear from the Winston-Salem Journal and I came this close to going to the Winston-Salem Journal um, to be to cover some suburb of Winston-Salem, which would have been an interesting alternate life, probably wouldn't have been fine. Uh, and then um, Jonathan Rausch was a reporter at the Winston-Salem Journal at the time. And Jonathan Rausch, who shows up in one way or another on nearly every episode of In Lieu of Fun. That's, he is, he is embodiment of fun. He is like the, he's the greatest of all journalists. And, and so I wrote to Jack Schaefer, somebody pointed out that City Paper, the Alt Weekly in Washington was looking for a reporter. And I wrote to Jack Schaefer, who was then the editor of City Paper and this legendary figure he'd hired, Kate Boo and Bill Gifford, Clara Jeffrey, uh, Edgar Mother Jones, Liza Mundy. Um, and I sent him some clips, bad, college clips and then my senior thesis, which was about Marion Barry. So I'd written a senior thesis, which was a very heavily reported thesis about the rise and fall of Marion Barry, the, the crack smoking uh, power player mayor of Washington. And Jack basically wrote me back saying, your clips are garbage, your thesis is good. Why don't you come work at City Paper? And so um, I came and was a reporter for Jack at City Paper for a couple of years and then he left and then David Carr became the editor and David was, uh, I was David's deputy editor. And that was, I mean, those two guys, like that is just a journalism education you cannot get anywhere these days. Jack was an incredible teacher, not intentionally. I mean, he doesn't, he, he disavowed teaching anything, but he was, he taught just by just, he, his, my favorite Jack Schaefer thing he did, which I recommend, you should do this at Law Fair. Kate, I don't know if you write and edit. So I sent Jack, a, a kind of draft of a story, a 7,000 word story. I think it was about some power plant in Georgetown or something. And Jack went through it. He did a global search and replace on every is, are, or be, every kind of to be verb in it. And he took them out and he replaced them, every one of them with the word fuck. <laughs> and he said, you cannot come back to me until you've gotten turned every one of these fucks into a different active verb. And so there was no, not a single sentence in that piece had an is, are, or be in it. It was just, it was the most muscular fucking story you've ever read in the end. And it wasn't, I wouldn't recommend that as like that working for every possible story, but man, it, it certainly made that story like hum and punch. So oh. I just want to say that uh, since David has just given this professional history, I want to line up my professional history next to it. Always about you, Ben. No, no, no. Because, Always about you. because <laughs> where David has just described a string of professional successes, every one of them parallels a Wittis professional failure. So while David was at City Paper, I applied repeatedly uh, uh, for a parallel reporting positions at City Paper, and Jack really? Schaefer rejected me every single time. Um, and um, and 
uh, even once told me, I don't think you'll ever be plots. Um, and, um, That's true. and Jack Schaefer, who was <laughs> one of my heroes, and I'm like, I, I think the world of him. And he was actually instrumental in starting my career because the final time he rejected me, he, and when he told me, I don't think you're ever going to be plots, what he meant by that was, I'm not a features writer, which is absolutely correct. It was an insight into who I am and what I write about. And he said, you're fundamentally, you're never going to, you're not going to be plots. You're fundamentally an analyst. And so I want you to uh, go to Legal Times and I'm going to call Tom Watson, who's an editor over there, and I'm going to bully him into hiring you. And that is what he did. And that is a, uh, was a huge uh, actual moment in my uh, professional life was kind of realizing that, you know, that was not an insult, but a good thing. So the other side of that is that David Carr, when David Plotz left City Paper, David Carr had a hole as a deputy editor and I was the last person cut for that. Uh, and he hired Eric Wemple instead of me. <laughs> and so like every component of the story David told just has like a witness professional failure associated. I but I kind of want to, it's a great story, but I also want to kind of put in the fact that like David said that like he could have gone to like the Salem, like Winston, what is it? The Winston Winston Salem uh, Journal. Yeah, the Winston Salem Journal. That's what I thought it was. And he was like, well, I could have gone there and it probably would have been an okay life. But like, this is kind of the point. Like, look, you guys two found each other and are like colleagues and friends like all of these years later. Like, oh, despite, we've been, we've been, like, maybe we you were, were at the same well, time, but like, I mean, but like, it's kind of amazing, right? That like, it all happened anyway. It's well, no, but I, David doesn't even remember that stuff. I, don't, so. I do not remember that. I, but I, I'm with you, Kate. I, well, I, maybe I take it the other way, which is uh, you guys know the movie Sliding Doors. You know, I love that movie. Yeah. No one has ever mentioned that movie to me before. <laughs> I mean, I think of those sliding doors moments all the time, just like the things where had you t had one path, I was this close to accepting a job at the Winston-Salem Journal, like this close. And had I taken it, life would have been completely different. There was another time I was actually, Ben was probably also later offered this job. Um, but I was offered when David left, David Carr left City Paper, I was offered the job as editor and I called to accept the job. And I, this was the old days. I didn't reach the person I was trying to, who was trying to hire me. I didn't reach her. And then, and I, I was totally happy to accept it. And then in the kind of next two hours, I had some weird random change of heart and I didn't take it. And I ended up staying at Slate and again, that would have been a radically different path in life. And it's just these very small things. I mean, I'm reminded, actually, this this gets to one of the things I want to talk to you about. Have you guys heard about this book, Rodham? Do you know about this? No. no but can I briefly describe Sliding Doors to people? Oh, yes, please do. So Sliding Doors is this amazing Gwyneth Paltrow film from like, I think the early aughts or 90s. I can't remember. But like, it's this great story. And it's like, the premise of the story is that like, she has this really bad day. She gets fired from her job and she's running down the stairs to catch a subway. And in one ver like all of a sudden the story like bifurcates and splits and tears apart. And like one version, she makes the subway and another, she just doesn't. And like, then you follow her along these two simultaneous paths of like how her life like leads. And actually, I don't want to ruin the movie for anyone. It's, just, it's actually very funny, very good, very poignant movie. I think I like, I don't know why it's not more popular. Um, but David, actually, to your point, my takeaway from that is like at the end of the day, like all of the thing, all of the things end up the same, and that like there is a little bit of indeter like like they all kind of they all kind of lead back to the same place, even though they look so different, and the outcomes are essentially the the same outcomes. If you remember the final scene remember. of the sliding doors, no, and so like that. I kind of just I think that there so not to like not to like make my point, but like, I think that that, that very much makes my point, but huh. I love that you brought that up. It's like one of my favorite movies. Interesting. Well, it's just to, that's interesting. I, I'm going to go rewatch it. And I, I, my, in my memory, it's that they take vastly different paths. It's like the, it's like, what's the, the famous science fiction story about the butterfly uh, yeah. where, you, where they, the person time travels and kills the butterfly and yeah, but anyways, we will we'll talk about this offline so we don't like spoil it for everyone. But anyways, but then, but then you kind of like you 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 eventually took over Slate. Um, yeah. But then you kind of eased into like as I have into 
a kind of bridge between journalism and other things. So it, like, how do you describe yourself now? Like, I, I mean, you do the Slate Political Gab Fest, but Alice Obscura is not really journalism. So like wh when people ask you what you are, what do you say about yourself? Well, Atlas Obscura, I was, not, and I was, uh, I went to Atlas Obscura as the CEO. So I, 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 Atlas Obscura is this incredible, at the time, it was a, basically a website that was a guide to the world's hidden wonders, like weird places around the world that users had contributed. And it was, it'd been co-founded by a guy named Joshua Four, who was Frank Four's youngest brother, Jonathan Safran's Four's younger the brother. famous Fours of Washington. Yeah, and Josh is- How many are there? No three, pun intended. There are three Fours. And they each are, you know, they're, J Josh is, Josh is. So 12? They're 12 fours. Uh, <laughs> actually times four, so it's 48 fours. Um, they, uh, Josh is this magical, wonderful, inspiring person who co-founded Atlas Obscura. And I, he and I started to talk at Frank's 40th birthday party, in fact. And I basically said, I think this is great. And if you got some money into it, it could be National Geographic. And so he decided, um, at the time there were, there were no employees and there was no money, just to hire me as CEO. And then I spent the six years building it. We built it from no employees to 60. We had this huge partnership with Airbnb, TV show in the works with major network, um, million selling book. And it was great. And I think what I describe myself as Ben is I, I no longer, I stopped thinking of myself as a journalist because I was a CEO. I had an editor in chief. I had Summer Mathis uh, from uh, City Lab was my second editor in chief. Rehan Harmansi of Gimlet was my first editor in chief. Um, and I think of myself as kind of a media creator, a person who makes things in media. And, and I can do that by active creation, but mostly it's around trying to build teams and galvanize people and to work together. So I, I don't think of myself as really like the, the, an actual journalist anymore, but more a person who helps journalists kind of get their message out to a community, builds a community, gives people new ways to experience things. Like I, one of the most important things I did at Atlas Obscura, in my view, was build a trips business. Like the point of Atlas Obscura was to get people out in the world. Um, so I don't really, that didn't really answer your question, but. Are, are you looking forward to being, to kind of writing again and being the, the, the content rather than the platform? I'm looking forward to trying it. I'm looking, I would like to be the ex-president of Estonia, by the way. If you can arrange <laughs> that, that, I would like that to be my job. I think, uh, I think Tomas on. really enjoys it actually. He's quite, he's quite pleased. It looked, he looked very comfortable in his easy chair, like kind of like waffling back and forth from the, from the background of Stanford. Yeah, he, he had a, he had a background, you know, a zoom background that he was kind of in and out of. But uh, I think the problem with being the ex-president of Estonia, you probably couldn't have embezzled huge amounts of money. It's probably such an uncorrupted country that he probably, I mean, maybe it's like a lot of Bitcoin or some kind of, some kind of <laughs> cryptocurrency that no one even knows about except a couple of people in Estonia and he's worth billions of that. But what's the country you could have be, be a great ex-president of and have made just, a, just an ungodly fortune and then- Ukraine. Ukraine. Yeah, I could be the ex, if, if someone has a job as ex-president of Ukraine, just let me know. All right. I would like to do that. That's a we good a, lead into Michael's question. Yeah, we have a question from Michael, AKA the big blue blogger. Uh, uh, Michael, is today the day you're gonna tell us your actual last name? Today is not your day. Strict neutrality. And, wait, 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 wait. You, you gotta start again, cause you were muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Indeed. Okay, great. Yeah, unfortunately, my employer, uh, which is a certain unnameable central bank, requires that we maintain strict political neutrality. Um, so I have to remain somewhat anonymous. Anyway, uh, the, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. But my, my question today kind of springs from David's new venture, um, on which I congratulate you. But um, I think your partner is the Henry Blodgett. Is that correct? Yes, it is the yeah, Henry um, Which takes us into kind of a dark space. It, it's, it's a funny coincidence that uh, Ben and Kate got dragged over the last 24 hours um, for their involvement with somebody who's uh, kind of been taken to task and, and 
uh, had to plead guilty to what some people regard as a procedural crime. I think Henry is kind of in the same situation. I wonder what your view is of how the criminal justice system treats those kind of white collar offenders and the way that that maybe undermines some of our trust in institutions and aggravates class relations? Uh, Fa fascinating question. Uh, David, yeah, your sure. thoughts on, on Henry Blodgett? Well, Henry, um, so I came to know Henry when he, after his troubles with uh, authorities, and, and I forgive me because I don't know the details. I do know, I mean, he, Henry was not criminally prosecuted. I don't think he was indicted. I think he did end up paying a fine um, for things that he, that he was uh, civilly charged with. Um, I don't know, I don't remember the details. I did used to know them, but I no longer remember them. And he ended up writing for us at Slate. He was an old college classmate of Jacob Weisberg, uh, and who was the, then the editor in chief of Slate. I was then the deputy, and and Jacob had the great idea to have Henry cover the Martha Stewart trial for Slate. And this was soon after Henry had gone. That's actually you know, brilliant, honestly. That's like that's was, amazing call. That's so it was, smart. It was a great idea, and Henry did an incredible job because he had he knew this world, and also he himself had just had this kind of real uh, difficult encounter, which he, I think he has apologized for and has talked about. Again, I, I I apologize for not having all the details. And then he continued to write, and I was his editor. And then he went off to be, become a uh, journalist CEO. He founded Silicon Alley Insider, became Business Insider, and that's become this whole incredibly successful and interesting media company that he runs. And uh, I, I, my view is that, that Henry is a great journalist and a great person in all my experience with him, who, uh, as far as I know, took responsibility for things that, that he uh, was accused of doing wrong, that he did wrong. And, and he has gone on to lead a life of productivity and usefulness. And he's created something real of real value in the world with, and employed lots of people. And I, I think that's wonderful. And I think that all, do I think that white collar criminals uh, of which Henry is not one, do I think that white collar criminals generally get off easier and allowed to restart their lives in ways that people who are not white collar criminals? I. I think probably yes, but Ben and Kate, you guys know that the answer to that question better than I do. Yeah, I, I just want to say that as a general matter, I think there is not a problem in this country of being too ready to give people their second acts. I think the problem is almost entirely on the other side. I have a strong agree friend who I you know, got to know when he was in prison. Um, he was a uh, bank robber. It was a violent crime. Um, he spent his time in prison teaching people how to read. He was a well-educated guy whose business had gotten in trouble and he decided that the appropriate way to handle that was to knock over a bank and, and got caught. Um, was not the best choice in life. Um, he um, spent uh, 15 years in prison teaching people to read and do designing Sunday New York Times level crossword puzzles uh, by hand on graph paper. Um, when I met him because he helped bring to my attention an innocent person who was in Virginia prison with him and we stayed in touch over the years. And, you know, I, I don't look, I actually don't really look behind that. I think like good people do horrible things sometimes and interesting people who are, uh, you know, bad people change, um, they develop and mature. And so I actually wanna, say that if, you know, if somebody came to me and had a whole lot of good material for lawfare from a federal prison, I would run that, run that in a heartbeat. I think that's a point of view that we don't get a lot of and we should. And if that person over time came out of prison and had uh, uh, 
you know, interesting stuff to say and had a role to play. I'm down with that. And, I, you know, obviously there are questions you have to ask, but I, I don't think we are defined by the worst things we did in life. Yeah, that is. Have you guys listened to Ear Hustle? Do you know the podcast Ear Hustle? I do know it. I haven't listened to it. I know it from your repeated recommendations oh. in, Is it really good? Uh, on the GabFest. Yeah, so it's a podcast that's done from inside the California state prison system. And uh, it's just a remarkable piece of journalism and humanity. And it, 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 it is astonishing, incredible work. So interesting. The stories told are fascinating, humane, and it is honest about what kind of crimes the people who are telling the stories have committed um, and, and what's, you know, there's this really inspiring piece of it, which is that one of the founders who had, was in prison for, I think, I think a second degree murder and he'd been in prison for 30 years, Erlon Woods, I believe his name is, uh, was pardoned by Jerry Brown in the last days of Jerry Brown's administration and, and is now, uh, Erlon is now outside and continues to do the show, but it's as a, as a document of like what prison life is like and what people in prison have to say about the world. Incredible. Yeah. I don't want to like pivot too much, but I'm about to pivot a whole yeah, lot. Pivot. Okay. Um, apparently the president just wrote to the speaker of the house, um, a letter that says effective today pursuant to section, uh, 1200-304 of Title 10 U.S. Code, I am authorizing the Secretary of Events to order units and individual members of the Selected Reserve to active duty to augment active component forces for the effective content of Enhanced Department of Defense. Uh, what does that mean? I don't know, but it kind of sounds like they're kind of ordering up the like people in the reserve to active duty. Yeah, the question is whether that's for a I can't COVID decide what this issue means. or whether it's because he wants them to build a border wall. Well, he says the defense of counter narcotic operation in the Western Hemisphere. Is this about the border wall? It must be. What? So I'm sorry to like, I'm just like, I just, I can't think of a better group of people to noodle through on this with at the moment, frankly. <laughs> yeah, but you're... I can think of better people than me. <laughs> not that. Well, you're not even drinking, David, so you might be the only sober one here. <laughs> necessary to ensure the Department of Defense can properly conduct operations required to meet our evolving security challenges. It's a new, it's a new executive order. That's um, kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's a... Uh, I just don't know what it means yet. Um, Actually, you know who would know what it means is Lisa Page. She's really smart. <laughs> uh, no, but she's not. This is she's not a military. No, I know. Person. But but Lisa, if you happen to be listening and happen to know what it means, text me. Um, yeah. Uh, the person or also who, Jen Daskal. Jen, you're in the you're in the audience. Jen, yeah, you, you want to join the conversation? Or if, with us. you know, if Steve Vladek is listening somewhere, this is the kind of question that that. Um, but. Um, Meanwhile, while we're sorting out whether the, why the president is calling up the reserves. Um, Can I add my little personal story that kind of mimics David Plotz's personal story of coming into journalism? Yeah. So David, I was, I graduated from college and I had been on the, and I had written my thesis on the Equal Rights Amendment and interviewed Phyllis Schlafly and like, and Karen DeCrow, who had been the president of now, and had done all of this work and somehow got a job at um, abcnews.com, which was like this redheaded stepchild in the basement of ABC News at the time. This was like 2006. Like no one thought that like internet news was real news. And um, then they broke the Mark Foley scandal, which was like, if you remember the yeah. page scandal that kind of happened with that. And so that was kind of the big moment. And then um, I left and I went to a few other places and bopped around and then like ended up working for Josh Marshall at Talking Points Memo for the 2008 election before I went to law school. Um, and I had this really great moment with Josh, which I will totally drag him for because he's eventually going to come on the show. But there's a great moment where I was like 23 years old and working for Josh. And I was like, um, he'd given me the muckraker beat. So I was just supposed to go and like kind of find all of these Republican people who were like doing corrupt stuff. And specifically he assigned me Alaska. So I was like making all of these calls to like P 
people who knew Ted Stevens and Don Young and uh, Sarah Palin, who was the governor at the time. And anyways, I started like, there was this thing called Trooper Gate that was happening. And I was like, Josh, there's this thing called Trooper Gate. And it's like, there's this, there's this governor and she's like, and she's like doing all this weird stuff and ordering the troopers to go after her, like her in-laws. And it's just like super bad politics and it's super corrupt. I'm going to cover it. He goes, Kate, you have the worst nuisance of anybody <laughs> I've ever met. <laughs> like, You just have no news. I'm like, well, can I just like write it up on her own? I like heard that she's like in the running for like the vice presidency. And he's like, there is no, everyone's in the running for the vice, they're never gonna give her the vice presidency. And so I like <laughs> on my own time at like 10 30 at night would write up these blog posts from like my, from my sources in Alaska on like, and so in August when she was named, I walked into that office and like people were like, oh my God, we've been covering Sarah Palin for months. <laughs> and like, I just had this like, Oh my God, thank God type of moment. Anyways, it was really fun. And like, it ended up being great. And Josh and I are like very close now, but it's very, it was a, it was kind of a funny, funny moment um, for me. That's, that is a great story. Yeah. Uh, I remember when Sarah Palin was chosen, we were actually taping our podcast. It was, we were literally taping, mid taping of the Gab Fest when it came out and we were so ignorant that none of us knew how to pronounce her name. None of us had ever, I, Emily and I, John had heard of her because John is a, John Dickerson is a real politics person, but Emily Bazelon and I were. I remember were, listening to the were, Gap Fest during that time. Uh, I think you yeah. cited something I wrote. Cause it was like, it was like one I'd covered, like I'd literally like watched all of her debate, like the videos of her debates, like from like when she ran from governor. Like I just like had all of like all of this completely useless knowledge. <laughs> like <laughs> All of a sudden was very useful. That is amazing. Can I, sorry, I forgot something which I want to get back to for the, the people who are paying attention because I, I really want to emphasize this book, which I just read and is about to come out. So Curtis Sittenfeld is a novelist. She wrote this novel, American Wife, which was a fictionalized uh, account of the life of Laura Bush. And she has a book coming out in a couple of weeks that is so good. And it's called Rodham. And it is a sliding doors book because it is about, the premise is Hillary Clinton went to Yale Law School fell in love with Bill Clinton, moved to Arkansas, and didn't marry him. And I love that. And then what happened in the world, like, and it's told by Hillary Clinton, it's from the perspective of Hillary Clinton, um, or Hillary Rodham, excuse me. And the book is magnificent. And I, I cannot recommend it highly enough to your, your dear watchers and listeners. Excellent. And it'll be the book to read. It's going to be the book. We'll, of we'll, we can we can tweet it out from our Twitter account and some other things. But yeah, totally great recommendation. So, David, I have a question for you about your voice. Yes, Ben. How often are yes, you ben. recognized by your voice, Ben? Yes, Ben. Uh, <laughs> my voice is, uh, as I like to say, I have a face for radio. Um, I am recognized a lot by my voice because I the ga I do the Gab Fest, which is this podcast that that John Dickerson, Emily Bazelon, and I have been doing for now fifteen years. So we're having our quinceanera this year. One of the oldest continuously running podcast. Oh yeah, one of the earliest, certainly. Yeah. I think we started. We literally started the year the word podcast was coined, so it was that early. Um, and uh, and and we have you know hundreds of thousands of people who listen to that podcast on a weekly basis, and they also. I think demographically are the kind of people who in the, in the before times, before this terrible time, uh, would go to the kinds of places I go, like farmer's markets or, or you know, <laughs> bars in Brooklyn. And so I would, and I have a very distinctive voice because it's very, it's deep. It's a very deep voice. I don't and, remember it as being quite as deep as it is now, but that might uh, just be my, I'm I might just, putting, just imagine I'm just putting John's, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm putting you're, just ima you're just pretending. Yeah. Yeah, I'm playing it a little deeper. Um, and so people, yeah, people really, they, because because the as you guys know from doing podcasts and podcast-like things, people have a deeply intimate connection with voices in their ears. They, in a way that much more than television, much more than read, reading something, you read something, even something that's very, got a real distinctive voice, you don't, you don't know what Jane Mayer looks like based on, or sounds like based on reading her. If you ran into Jane Mayer on the street and heard her speaking, it wouldn't, you wouldn't immediately think, oh, that's Jane Mayer. I recognize her from her text. It is the human voice 
and the particularly the human voice as it is transmitted to you in earbuds is so intimate. And so if you're there often enough and you talk enough, you become very familiar to people and very connected to people. And, and that's why I think even John Dickerson, who is a television person who is on tel you know, 60 Minutes, Face the Nation, CBS This Morning, shows that are watched by millions and millions of people, is recognized as often for his voice as he is for his face because the voice is such a, such a warm, connecting thing. Can I ask a weird question? Do you find yourself when you want moments of privacy, not speaking as, or like trying to speak less so that people don't recognize no. your voice? No? No, I mean, I, I think I do remember my, my, uh, uh, my ex and I were in Brooklyn with our children and we were somewhere in, in Brooklyn on a weekend and our one of our or more of our children was behaving poorly and I remember screaming at <laughs> our children and Hannah screaming at our children and somebody walking by recognizing us and by our voice and being like oh you're, you're David Plotz and Hannah Rosen and just feeling aghast at that um but no I'm not it's not that level of fame it's like a very tiny 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 bit of fame for a tiny set of people who listen to podcasts about politics I was, I grew up in Rochester, New York, as this podcast knows, and there was this one really distinctive voice. I think he's syndicated now, like a guy named Bob Lonsberry, who is very, um, very kind of um, controversial. But anyways, he had a very distinctive, annoying voice. And like, I remember I was at, I was at the airport at the Rochester airport and he was like flying to New York and I was flying to New York. And I was like, I swear that's Bob Lonsberry. And he just like, wouldn't talk. And like people were like doing the like the very in Rochester, it's a small town. It's very like people talk at the airport to each other. And like he was just like not talking. And I felt like he was trying to basically like maintain his anonymity by not talking, which is why I kind of ask. Sorry. I mean, yeah. I find I, I, your voice is much more distinctive than mine, David. And I find that I am routinely recognized by the sound of my voice. And you have a super distinctive voice. You have an incredibly you, distinctive voice, Ben. Yeah, I completely. Like yours. Um, but anyway, you both, I, you both have pretty distinctive voices, like in different ways. But like, yeah, they're both very, and you both do a ton of, ton of like a ton of broadcasting. Like you do a lot of like putting things out on the tape that people can listen to. It's true. Although I, I, I do think that there, first of all, I don't do anything like the Gab Fest. I think the Gab Fest has an order of magnitude more listeners than anything that I put out. And the other thing about the Gab Fest that I think is distinctive is it's the same three people for 15 years. And you want to talk about intimacy having a weekly conversation with three people who have a particular chemistry over a long period of time. And even if you've only listened to it for say five or seven years, rather than all 15, um, you get to know the dynamic between David and Emily, between John and Emily, between John and David, um, very, very well in a way that that creates a sense that you know these people, right? And I, and I can't think of another, um, I mean, yeah. I can't think of another thing that's been as long yeah. running that's that personal. You know, that's, I hadn't, weirdly I had not put it in those terms, Ben, but I think that's true. I mean, we, we have been doing this for a long time. They, John and Emily have become just total we started out as we were colleagues and we were certainly friendly colleagues but the act of doing this has just made us just truly intimate deep 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 friends and yet we still have things to talk to each other about and and last week and in fact today we taped this morning we had two weeks ago we had a, just a knockdown drag out vicious fight like a vicious 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 fight we were all angry at each other and you know in the way that you can get angry with somebody you love and that was magical it was and it was the fact that we can still surprise each other and still uh still take delight in each other and still anger each other is lovely and it, it is it's much more it's much less um 
it's much more like a kind of familial relationship than it is like uh, a professional relationship at this point because of that quality, which is- And, I, and how much of it is like, so I, I don't know John all that well, um, but I know Emily quite well and I know you very well. How much of the David plots that is on the Gab Fest is a persona? Um, you know, for example, you know, you always play up the plots doesn't like pandas thing, yeah. right? There are certain features of your personality yeah. that you kind of emphasize a little bit. I always find like the, 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 the Gab Fest plots is kind of like a, it's like a really good caricature of actual David yeah. Plotts. Yeah. Um, what's the, what are yeah. you tweaking? Yeah, well, I think uh, I'm a performative person. And so it, it gives me pleasure to kind of put something out there that's, that's, that's intended to have an audience and to be, to give pleasure and to the audience. I, I think of, I think, and I'm not sure that John or Emily even thinks of it this way. I really do think of the Agafest as entertainment, that it is it's there to bring, bring people pleasure, not necessarily to inform them. If it informs them, great, but mostly it, it's companionship and pleasure. And when you are a performer and an entertainer, you, you, you take advantage of those tools. And so I think your characterization is exactly right, Ben. It is a, it is a caricature of myself. I'm not nearly as much of an asshole in real life as I <laughs> am often on the GabFest. I am not nearly as, and I also, one of the, I reckon John and Emily are so much smarter than I am and they have so much subject matter expertise. So Emily is so good on all legal questions. She's, she's like a, has a clarion crystalline mind and it can explain things so beautifully. And John similarly has this, this encyclopedic knowledge of politics and a perspective on politics. I have nothing. And, and so what I'm there to do is to provoke and to aggravate and, and so my, I feel like my job uh, is to aggravate them. And but, you also, but you do have something that neither of them has, which is range. I mean, Emily is a legal, is a legal person yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, like blah, blah, blah. I am. Yeah. And like, I don't say this as any bit of a criticism, but we're pretty narrow. And John, you know, he, he's a religion. He has a, like a deep, he thinks deeply about religion and he thinks really deeply about politics, specifically American political history and the present, you are, uh, you cover a huge amount yeah, of ground. But, 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 but I know so little about any of it, Ben. I mean, I, 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 am, I can bring a perspective and I can tie things together, but, but I really do. I think the, 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 sh the show is that, uh, is that John and Emily are these wise people and I'm kind of a, and I'm, I'm kind of the, the, the pig in the trough, uh, I'm the I'm the turd in the punch bowl, whatever it is, to just there to to kind of stir things. And I'm my I'm much happier with I like the conflict. I like I like it when we fight. I like it when there's contention and where there's argument and much more than they do. I mean they're, they're both at this point we're all comfortable with each other. But but I think that uh, I think that dramatically the, understates the rule. But like I also kind of see how you see yourself as the foil to them like that makes sense to me like I wouldn't like I wouldn't put like the negative turn on it that you do but I do see you as like kind of like I, I do think you was like you spoil for a little bit of a fight you present the libertarian counter argument pretty like regularly you like present the other types of argument and like that's actually I think to Ben's point is like the range that he's describing right like I think that that's like that is a necessary part to be able to do that intelligently yeah, I mean, I think the the biggest shift in the Gabfest actually the first few years, John was the host. John was the per, the kind of main host, were all the hosts, but John was the person who introduced the show and kind of framed the questions. And then at some point, I was like, this doesn't make sense because actually, I'm the person who should be asking the questions mostly because I know least, and I'm also the one who like can I can aggravate and needle these two in ways <laughs> that they don't do to me because they're they're nicer. Uh, and so that we made that shift at some point. So we have a question from Christy in Portlandia. Hi, David. I remember some years back, you gave out your home phone number on this late podcast, much to um, your co-host chagrin. And so I was just wondering if you have any good stories from the calls or you still get calls. 
I don't have a home phone number anymore, actually. So I just have myself. <laughs> he canceled give his it. landline, my, Christy. My, my, that's my the, phone number that's is 202-431-4106. You're welcome to call me. Um, I actually, I'm not much of a, I mean, I, this is back right before 9-11, I was, wrote this long article for GQ, which was the case against privacy. And it was just about how a lot of what people thought of as privacy, I just thought was ridiculous. I, I haven't gone back and looked at it um, and to know whether I still agree with it after all these years, but it, I put a, I put my, I think I put my social security number in there. I put my address, I put my mother's maiden name, um, by date of birth. And I was basically, I think, I think, I think. And I sort of said like, you know what, there, I'm, I'm, I, think the benefits that I gain from sharing information about myself in the world outweigh the costs and the risks of giving this information to co governments and corporations. Do I, st I don't know if I still believe what I wrote then, but I don't have any good stories about giving out my home phone number, except that insofar as I gave out my home, one of the reasons I gave out my home phone number, I don't remember if this is why, is that I did a book that was about a, uh, a genius sperm bank. And I love that book. Thank you. And so I was trying to find people who were children of the sperm bank. And I said, if you- I have one of them, sorry. You have a child of a genius sperm bank? Yeah, he's one of my best friends from growing up. Really? From yep. the from the repository of Germinal Choice or some other sperm bank? I don't know if it's that one, but it was definitely from a genius sperm bank, yeah. There aren't that many of them. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, anyways, That's so we can talk about it later. But like my, yeah, what? he was like, I'm completely obsessed with this. This is why I've read your book. But like, yeah. Can you can you tell me a little bit more about who that person is later? I'd be yes, curious totally. If I know them already. Yes. Well, he went to Yale, <laughs> so you might imagine. <laughs> he now has a lot of money because he's a genius, and he did like he basically made a ton of money. Um, well, but no, he's like one of my very, 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 very oldest and best friends from when I was in high school. So yeah. That, my experience with the kids of the Nobel Prize Sperm Bank is that they were not geniuses at all. They are definitely not <laughs> that they were very much like what their mothers. So they were people, their mothers had gone to the sperm bank. They'd gotten the sperm from the genius donors. And then the kids turned out like, as you'd expect, they would given who their mothers were. So if their mothers were, you know, successful professionals, the kids that turned out to be successful professionals, if their mothers were not the kids, if, you know, if their mothers are working class drivers, the kids have turned out to be working class drivers. And they are very much subject to like the ones who grew up in suburbs in the Midwest are kind of stuck in suburbs in the Midwest or exurbs in the Midwest. And the ones that grew up in fancy college towns have gone on to go themselves live in fancy college towns and have professional careers. So it's, it's much more about the destiny that's imposed on you by where you're born and who, who raised you than it is like, oh, my donor is such a genius. I don't disagree with that, but Did like you, his mom was pretty lovely and amazing. I, I bet. Did you we'll come talk away about with, from that book with the sense that, I mean, you know, the premise is a kind of eugenic, um, uh, we can breed brilliance. Your account of who these people are is a real kind of triumph of, of nurture over nature. Um, yeah. Did you come away with a sense that genes are overrated? Yes. And I, certainly, I certainly came, so the, I wrote the book 15 years ago, and now I have 15 years more with these kids and seeing who they are now. And they're, you know, they're very good. They've had live, you know, they're in their thirties now, mostly. And, and I'm not saying this was a great eugenic test. These were not, it wasn't like everyone programmed the sperm and that it's not that all of the donors were in fact the greatest people of our time in no sense is that true but it seems to me so clear that they are that the dominant thing that's happened to them is they've been guided by the forces of their where they were raised and sort of what kind of person their mother who raised them was and that, that seems to me to dwarf everything else that you can look at in who they've become and and so yeah i guess that is I'm not saying that obviously, you know, I'm not saying that obviously our genes shape us, but. And you say mother just specifically because some of like so many of these people were like raised by single, single women. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and is that what you would have predicted or would you have uh, predicted something a little bit more like the Shockley thesis, which is, Hey, if you get a bunch of Nobel prize winners to donate sperm, they're going to produce a whole lot of 
extraordinary children. I, God, I, I'm trying to conjure myself back to what I thought at the time. Well, I thought that the book kind of made this, well, I thought that the idea too about Nobel Prize winners are abnormal. Like there's not, there's not, like they're not normal genius. Like you could take normal genius and like having an, like the exceptional kind of people that the genetics create to make a Nobel Prize winner is like closer to having like a Van Gogh, right? Than it would be to having like a, uh, I don't know, something else, but like, I'm like, or I don't know, like uh, an Ansel Adams. Uh, so like, I just kind of, I think that there's, there was that, but well, maybe the, I'm misinterpreting. The, I think that maybe you, you may have read that somewhere else in a better book, <laughs> better different book than mine. My, well, one of the weird things about the Nobel prize sperm bank is that the Nobel prize winners washed out quickly. There are not a lot of Nobel prize winners. They didn't want to donate to some weird quasi racist eugenic sperm bank for the most part the few who did were old uh and they have low sperm counts because anybody who's over 40 is basically a bad sperm donor anyway um so and you don't win a nobel prize when you're 40 or when you're 22 and so the donors they ended up getting for the bank were not in fact the nobel prize winners they were some different set of men who were vaguely accomplished depending on how you how you looked at it um and also the weird, uh, the weirdest piece of this case, this is not what you're talking about, sorry, is that women didn't want the Nobel sperm. So that when women were presented, they were given this catalog of sperm donors and the Nobel prize winners were among them in the early days. That the Nobel prize winners, if you could pick, you would, you would read a, the description of somebody as a pre preeminent scientist and you know uh, uh, IQ of 190 or whatever it was. And women would not pick the guys who were the Nobel prize winners because they were short. They there was nothing about them having a happy temperament. They weren't musical or athletic, which is are things that people when people are looking for the be the parent of their uh, child, they think well, musical gifts and athletic gifts are more likely to be carried on genes, and so they will look for that. And and so there's this adage in the sperm banking world: nobody buys the short sperm. And and so there's this way i guess i'm done <laughs> yeah there's no there's no witness there's no super witness babies out there yeah exactly just the ones you got <laughs> um and and so and so so the, the, there's this weird way in which they they were trying to have this eugenic sperm bank with all these geniuses and what women wanted were happy tall musical men not yes. super geniuses like that's who you would go and pick because i think people think those are things like actually genius, maybe it'll come, maybe it won't. What will come is if they'll be tall, that'll give them an advantage. They'll be, you know, musical. That will be so nice to have in our house. They'll be athletic. That will be, they'll be, that'll make them healthier or something like that. There's a really great, um, there's a really great scholar, just FYI, in case, I don't know, you probably know about him, but um, Glenn um, Cohen, who's at Harvard, who does all of this incredible work about sperm banks and kind of gametes, like and rights to gametes and the market for gametes. Oh, really? um, I don't yeah. know. I, Anyways, it might, it just like, I'm just work. like throwing that out there because it's kind of, it's like, I don't know if you still are interested in this topic, but it's like a fascinating topic because there's all of these kind of mandatory disclosure rules that certain countries are like are contemplating about giving um, giving sperm and uh, meaning like you can't give sperm anonymously and it's just like killed the market for it. Like right. no one wants to give it. Um, right. And so it's kind of right. a super interesting kind of right. like fallout. Well, but it's also the case like, I mean, no one wants to give sperm anonymously, but it, it, 23 and me basically murdered the idea that you could. That once, once 23andMe came along and people were able to share that information, it was clear like, oh, you're going to, even if you can't immediately find your donor father, you're going to find your siblings. And then if that, if your donor father had any real, not real, if your donor father had any children under his own name, you're going to be able to find them. And, and so the, the, the entire premise of anonymity was mooted by technology. And so they have to, they're going to have to reset around some other principles. And I actually haven't followed whether they've managed to do it. It's basically the sperm donor version of contact tracing. Yes. I was yeah. actually going to say, we're just going to have like a law and order episode that's like this for like the Golden State Killer, but like, like with like some type of like, it's like a sperm, like the Golden State Killer is a sperm donor and like has like basically gone out and like, 
I don't know. It'd be like a good way to like disguise well, yourself. Between the, murdering people, he's yes, but you, wait, that's actually totally <laughs> <Yeah>. feasible. <laughs> one, one of the that, that that this is not exactly the same point, but one of the things that was so shocking to me is that so I met a lot of sperm donors in the course of doing my research, and there is a distinct hyper narcissist sperm donor type. Yep. Uh, guys who really want to kind of win the genetic lottery that by fathering children and they they're guys who would go from sperm bank to sperm bank to sperm bank not really revealing that they had donated to the california cryobank as they're at uh as they're at uh, virginia cryobank and the result is they're they're guys who have fathered dozens scores of children um and like the genghis khan gene yeah they get right 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 except yeah i mean they probably it's and probably share a kind of vanity and narcissism, but are not such good global conquerors as Genghis Khan was. <laughs> not so good with the We sword. can only hope. <laughs> On that note, uh, we should wrap. But David Plotz, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Kate, what's our situation tomorrow? Oh my God, every time you tell, oh, our situation tomorrow. Don't ask me for a sign off then. Okay, I I'm not gonna ask you for Okay, a so <laughs> I haven't planned it. Um, I always mean to, but then I have like seven hours of Zoom meetings leading up into this and it like kills me. Um, uh, tomorrow, uh, we have Seth Magaziner, um, the, uh, the treasurer, the current treasurer of Rhode Island uh, to talk to us about state budgets and uh, the current state of affairs. It's gonna be an ugly conversation. David Plotz, do you have any final words of, of wisdom to blast out there into the 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 ether no i just it's such a pleasure kate it was great to meet you and ben you're somebody who i've loved and admired for years and it's so nice to see you playing all these different mediums so it's nice to it's nice to play with you here you and too man let's have another and, walk and one of these days let's take a walk yeah let's all take right. a walk david come back on the show it was so fun to have i'd you. love to it was lovely to be here so we will be back tomorrow at five with uh seth magaziner uh, and remember, until then, more things will happen with Boris Johnson, Kim Jong-un. We'll update you. And until then, if you can't have fun, in lieu of fun, you can still come and hang out with us. Goodbye, Ben.